Here's our blade core. Here's our platform. Here's the ridge that I want to follow. I've got my platform located right between two straight ridges so that I can get a trapezoidal shaped prismatic blade. Got a different holding device. This works a lot better than the uh, and the holding blocks I was using before. Push that in there. I'll show you this here again in a minute. But, uh, I had to move the camera into the shade. I really can't see the viewfinder here. But uh, you can see the platform right there. You see where the crack initiated right behind where the antler tip was making contact with the platform. You can see how it was located between two ridges right here. That way I get a blade that's trapezoidal shaped in cross section like this here rather than triangular shape. This one's not the best, but gives you an idea and uh, I'll show you some sketches here of uh, what the tip looks like okay here's my platform right there now here's the important part the tip I'm trying to look in the viewfinder here so I'm wiggling all over but the tip and I'll show you again on a drawing is recessed right there to fit right on that platform and I like to eyeball that before I remove every flake to make sure it's perfect and it's in line with a nice ridge right here and we'll go ahead and remove that flake Hope to get a nice long blade. I had veered off to the side just a little bit. We've got a nice straight edge right there though. And We've got a nice, really nice ridge right there. So I'll go ahead and set up a platform and we'll take one off right there. The width between your ridges is what determines the width of your blade. That and the amount of force that you're putting on the chest crutch. The more force you put on it, the deeper it's going to bite into the behind the platform and the thicker your blade's going to be, the wider. Here's our platform right there. So this is a fairly straight blade, and that's what I'm after, is really straight blades to put in the edge of the weapon. The bulb is fairly small. Um, this one actually has an aurelia on it, right on the bulb. I don't know if that's showing up, but it's very rare when you're using the softer tip 
either the antler or the wood almost never leaves an aurelia. Copper will almost every time. So that's one we can use. Okay, here's the uh, tip of our chest crutch. And I've done a little sketch over here. This area right here is the groove that I'm talking about. And you'll notice it's recessed right in here. So what I usually do here is every now and then, maybe after every 30 blades or so, I'll just take this a little uh, shirt flake right here and just sand that a little bit until I deepen that groove to make sure it's in there. Because if I lose that groove and it ends up looking like this, which is the way I start it when I start making these notch tips right here, this area right here a lot of times will make contact with the edge of the platform. I'll show you another sketch here in a minute. When it does that, a lot of times the platform will collapse or you'll get a step or a hinge fracture. So uh, this works really well. You can also use the very tip right here for times when you want your pressure area to be a little bit further in from the edge. I'll show you what I mean here in a minute. Okay, this shows the very tip of the chest crutch in contact with the platform on the core. And you can see how this acts as a sort of a gauge to maintain the same distance from the very edge of the core over here to where it's actually applying pressure right behind the platform in order to remove another flake. Okay, here it is, a little bit larger. Kind of exaggerated, but you get the idea. So this distance right here from there to there is determined by how you make this notch right here. What I like is all I have to do, I don't have to look at it, my eyes aren't that good anymore, and I can position that. I know it's going to be positioned exactly the same depth every time because of that. Now sometimes I might want to actually apply pressure a little bit further, maybe right in here. When I want to do that, obviously I can't get this notch over here, so then I'll use the very tip of the chest crutch and place it over here. So I actually have two working surfaces on the crutch. Now here's a wooden chest crutch tip. This is actually ebony. And uh, you can see the same thing. This works in some ways better than the antler. It takes a little more force in order to get the uh, crack to start. But you get a thinner flake, a lot flatter bulb, and you can get more blades from uh, the same core than you could if you're using the antler and uh, both will give you far more blades from a core than using copper. So here's a shot of all three of my crutches. Copper, antler, and the ebony wood. The copper is archaeologically correct for some of the cultures in Europe. Obviously it's not in Mesoamerica. I'm sure they're using the, uh, the hardwood. Nobody knows what type of wood, but uh, that's ebony. I believe that comes from Africa. Notice that my antler tipped uh, chest crutch here is a little bit thin in this direction. I like that because it actually bows a little bit, builds up some tension, and I feel that gives you a little bit more contact time when the, when the uh, blade actually detaches. So in the old days when I did those core videos about five years ago, I was using these holders, which are probably more aboriginal looking, but they have a lot of disadvantages. One is the flake is trapped in here and it causes the, the blade to actually break an awful lot of times and of course that's the whole purpose of doing this is to produce an intact blade. This is maybe not so able looking but it could easily be made from uh, from Aboriginal materials in a variety of different ways. The nice thing about this is I've got bungee straps on here. I put the sock on there just to protect the bungee straps so I don't uh, tear them. And the nice thing is, it just slips into that, this area between the 2x4s very easily. And the area where you're going to detach the blade is free completely. It'll fly up against this little curtain right here, which is nothing more than a sock attached to the bungee <laughs> straps here. Hits that and drops down, and the nice thing is you get an intact blade almost all the time. When I'm working larger cores, instead of using this area, I can put it over here, flip it around, and that allows a pretty large core to fit in there and actually just reverse it.
which is pretty handy. So it's nothing more than some bungee straps attached on here like this. These are screwed into here. A couple of screws to keep it good and secure so it'll last a long time. Put a little epoxy in there just to keep these from uh, loosening up. Pretty basic. Now these cores usually start off looking like this, sort of tongue shaped. And then I'll just take a uh, hammer stone and knock off that first blade. And that allows me to start removing blades with a copper pressure flicker chest crutch which works a lot easier than the antler for the very early stage blades and they'll look like this they're pretty much junk so these just get thrown in the waste pile they're not really prismatic very much they're just kind of wild and irregular but once you get these removed your next set second or third pass will start having these nice straight ridges that allow you to follow them and then you can control the width of your blades by how you stage those ridges So this was sort of brief and fast, and, and I know that's too much information to really be able to do this effectively on just a short video like this. I'm going to do a longer video in the future, and uh, probably 30, 40 minutes just on how to do this process from start to finish. And uh, this is the one part about making the Mac Weedle that's probably the most difficult, is trying to actually make these prismatic blades. And if you plan to make a Mac Weedle and you need a set of blades, just uh, send me an email, we'll see what we can do for you. And uh, everything else is pretty pretty easy as far as making these things. The actual Maca Weedle. Okay, the next thing I want to do is to make some yucca cordage so that we can wrap the handle like this and uh, that'll give it a good grip. There's nothing really, as far as the uh, Mayan codexes and stuff, that I can see where they actually wrapped it with anything. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But they definitely were pretty artistic on uh, on various designs on the rest of the Mac Weedle and who knows you know they probably uh, some of them were probably uh, enhanced by some means for the handle to make it grip a little bit better. So this is a little Joshua tree right here that I'm nursing along trying to get it big enough so I can transplant it in my yard it's from the desert and this is basically the same thing this is a California yucca and the Joshua tree is in the yucca family it just has shorter leaves these are agaves, by the way, and uh, sometimes called century plants. It's the stuff they make tequila out of. It's a nice plant. Oh, you can make cordage out of this stuff, too. So I like to just start off by pounding the uh, leaf with a little mallet here. You can use a rock, whatever. This is wet. I feel like it a little bit better. Better uh, separation. If I do it wet, there's less chance of actually damaging the fibers. So I just do that down the full length of it. So after I've pounded it flat, <clears throat> I like to twist it like this, kind of into like a rope, and then pound it again, and that really, really loosens up the fibers. So we've got some nice separated fibers now that will be really easy to separate from this leaf. And they're nice and long, which will allow us to uh, not have to make so many splices. So you just separate out a few strands here. enough to get started here. Got one there. Trying to make them about equal uh, equal size here. Take our strands here and let's see if that's showing up in there. Yeah, go like that. I'm going to get this closer. All right, I think that's better. Just twist it like that, form a little loop, then take half the threads from this piece 
in half from this one here and just sort of combine them over like that maybe another one over there and spin that clockwise and then take your other one and spin it clockwise so it's a clockwise twist here then come back over a half a turn counterclockwise over the other strand take spin it clockwise over the other strand and that's it you do the whole thing like that unless you're clumsy like me and <laughs> but what you can do is just go ahead and spin it on your leg like that bring it over clockwise twist bring it over counterclockwise over the other strand clockwise twist bring it over the other strand clockwise and then clockwise and then counterclockwise rotation over the other strand when you're ready to make it thicker what you do is you take another strand and you splice it in there so you get your two pieces here this is not my field of expertise that's why I'm a little clumsy at this but it's coming out okay so you just take your strand and you splice it in there like that rotate it clockwise on one strand counterclockwise over the other clockwise over the other clockwise over the other and you can just keep on going right on down like that until you get toward the end to where your strands are becoming thinner and then you need to splice in another let's see if that's showing up in there okay and the reason I have this I'll show you in a minute here that way I can feed it back through and you don't have a, an end on the end of your cordage so I'm going to do that full length so here's my completed cordage it's over 20 foot long and you notice it gets thicker as I go along I want the handle to actually swell up what you need to do is go back over here and trim off these little ends and pieces that stick out until it's all nice and clean yeah these thicker sections I forgot to mention are done just by splicing in a lot more strands like maybe five or six strands into each side instead of just one or two this is thick enough here you could probably uh, do a bowstring with it so just made a little noose in the end of the rope put it on here like that and we'll start wrapping it all the way around till the end we just keep wrapping it like this until we get to the very end. So here's our completed handle and I made the cordage thicker to actually allow the handle to swell up a little bit right there. It has a good grip. I need to secure that with a little drop of high glue. That's where I finished it with a little knot. It's probably a way to actually secure the end of the cordage but I don't really know. So there it is so far. We just got to add the blades and it looks like I'm going to have to do a third segment on this uh, video. Here's the opposite side. It's got a really nice wood grain. I love this wood. <laughs> 